Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm Soren, really more tentacles, Gavoyich, and today we're looking at Deep Rising, the movie that dares to ask, what if Speed 2 had a tentacle monster? Deep Rising is a dumb, fun, 50s-style B-monster movie, and it was released in 1998 among a surge of similar films like Anaconda, Lake Placid, and The Relic. The movie's dumb, but I absolutely love it. Unfortunately, the 90s film-going audience did not. The movie only made 11.5 million against a budget of 45 million, making it a bigger bomb than any of its on-screen explosions. Part of its failure was due to timing. The need for extensive behind-the-scenes effects work delayed the release for over a year, causing it to open just three weeks after Titanic. And the last thing the world wanted to see was yet another cruise ship disaster. And critics weren't kind to it either, saying it borrowed too heavily from other films like Aliens, Predator, and Jurassic Park. It even made it onto Siskel and Ebert's Worst of 1998 list. Deep Rising was written and directed by Steven Summers, who would find much greater success the following year with The Mummy. This high seas adventure, originally titled Tentacle, features a lot of recognizable actors. You got Treat Williams from The Phantom, X-Men's Fomka Jansen, and Kevin J. O'Connor, who Summers would cast again as Benny in The Mummy. He's a really fun director to work with, and he's like an amusement park, like an amusement park exploding. As for its monsters, Deep Rising is kind of old school, keeping its creatures hidden for most of the film. But when they finally do appear, they're rendered in CGI that still holds up, thanks to effects work by DreamQuest Images and Industrial Light and Magic. Yes, the George Lucas company that did effects for Star Wars and Jurassic Park. Deep Rising follows John Finney Finnegan as he's hired by a group of mercenaries planning to hijack a cruise liner. Once on board, they find the ship destroyed, the crew and passengers missing, and something sinister rising from the deep. Joined by a thieving love interest named Trillian and his not Tom Noonan sidekick Joey, the lovable scoundrels try to survive by shooting guns, making quips, This is turning out to be one hell of a day. And, uh, you know, shooting even more guns. <laughs> Hello? Hello, is this, am I coming in clearly and? Oh, okay, good. James won't let me go pantsless on the new set. <laughs> so I had to get this secret message out to my pantsless proponents out there. And if there's one company that wants you to look your best while you're porky pig in it, well, that's today's sponsor, Manscaped. Now, if I've timed this right, it should be April. And that's good because it's National Testicular Cancer Awareness Month. You see, for those spherically endowed between the age of 15 and 35, testicular cancer is the most common form. So, Manscaped has partnered with the Testicular Cancer Society, partly by donating $25,000 to support those impacted by testicular cancer, but also by reminding you, yes you, of the importance of being vigilant. But how do you do that, you might ask? Well you can visit manscaped.com slash TCS to learn how to perform simple routine self-checks. Hell, make regular checks part of your down there care. Like when you're using Manscaped's Crop Mop Ball Wipes or Lawnmower 4.0 Body Trimmer. And the Lawnmower 4.0 is another way you can protect your balls. Sure, you know, not from cancer, but its skin safe technology really helps reduce nicks and cuts down there, which can be a serious matter too. It's so beautiful. Zorin, are you filming a sponsor segment in the bathroom? Crap, looks like my time is up. Uh, just remember what I said. Protect your balls. God damn it, are you pantsless again? Pants are the shackles of society! Start protecting your balls with promo code KILLCOUNT20 for 20% off your order, plus free shipping at manscaped.com. And remember to perform routine self-checks while you're keeping your jewels clean. How many tentacles will we get from these tentacles? Let's find out and get to the kill. The movie begins with a little light bathroom reading, but it's hard to get through it all when this Jerry Goldsmith score keeps knocking on the door. I'll be out in a minute, Jerry! Gaw! A fish-eyed fish of some kind takes us Jaws style into a title card. And now we're on a boat that looks like it got most of its equipment from a Nostromo fire sale. Its captain is John Finney Finnegan, who loves playing video poker and working on catchphrases. Now what? I'm sure he'll land on something better, maybe. Finney's played by the criminally underrated Treat Williams, who I affectionately refer to as T-Bill. 
T-Bill, or should I say Finnegan's crew, consists of the mechanic Joey Panucci and his girlfriend Layla, who's played by Una Damon, who my wife tells me was in Charmed, and, you know, not much else. Fuck you! They've been hired by a man named Hanover, played by seasoned Cherokee Nation actor Wes Studi. This sphinx of a man leads a group of mystery mercenaries that include Mulligan, Mamuli, Mason, T-Ray, Vivo, and Billy. Yep, just Billy. Most of these mercs are certified kill count veterans too. There's Trevor Goddard, who played Kano in the horror adjacent Mortal Kombat. Clifton Powell, who was Jaybird getting dead dunked in bones. Jason Fleming, the Santa fraud who fucked with Chucky's mind. Cliff Curtis, who was best bro Billy Freeman in Doctor Sleep. And Jaiman Hansu, who was man on island in A Quiet Place too. Who? Exactly. They compare the sizes of their weapons, with Joey proving his is the biggest. That is until he opens a case to see what they're really packing. And hoo hoo boy, are they overcompensating. Vivo discovers Joey peeping at their manly missiles, which leads to a Benny beatdown. And despite a bunch of padding, this was more real than actor Kevin J. O'Connor would have liked. One of the younger actors was a little ex overexcited and was kicking me. I had wells. Everything was black and blue. Finnegan fires some critter quills against the wall, stopping the fight with a few testosterone groans and grumbles from the mercs. The mercenaries have hired Finnegan and co. to take them to an undisclosed location in the South China Sea. Middle of nowhere squared. Turns out that's the perfect location for a fucking epic boat party! <laughs> There were 450 extras in this scene, playing passengers, fire jugglers, Chinese dragons, Willie Scott waitresses, and all sorts of other cultural appropriations. <laughs> Even the boom mic operator shows up for the maiden voyage of the largest ship not to have its own Celine Dion song. And what's that ship's name? The Argonautica! Who, the Wattica? The Argonautica! Got it. The Boobs and Buttica is owned by Simon Canton, an incredibly wealthy asshole who welcomes his incredibly wealthy guests aboard. One of his non-rich guests is a stowaway named Trillian St. James, a name writer-director Stephen Summers admits he took from The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Trillian is directed not to look at the camera until she takes a drink of some Santana champ, cause it's so crisp. Originally, Claire Forlani from Mallrats was cast as Trillian, but she left three days into filming due to creative differences with Summers. She was quickly replaced by Famke Jansen, who had recently played thigh master assassin Xena Onatop in Goldeneye. Trillian takes her drink with an Oliver Twist and picks a pocket or two of the ship's captain. It gets her a key card, but nothing else. Not even an Outback Steakhouse coupon. Boo! Trillian uses the key card to break into a locker near the Harry Potter ride, but when she tries to nip a necklace and tuck it away, she's found and arrested by Canton and Captain Atherton. With no brig, they stow her in the prison fridge with the rest of the criminal veggies. While Trillian acts like Homer ignoring monsters in the shinning, a mysterious figure loads the Hobbit trilogy into the ship's computer. But nobody's gonna watch that shit, so the ship shuts down and the crew panics until they're attacked from the rising deep. An absolutely epic stunt sequence follows, as 100% of the 1% are tossed around like ragdolls. Many a stunt performer leaps over ledges while other folks go through glass and tables. What's that called, James? Bagad. Ah, Bagad. Well, nothing really looks like a fatal injury for the Count. Oh, except for this old man, who I guess died of consumption, judging by the hand blood. As a produce prison riot breaks out, fuck you, cabbage! Another passenger can't hold it in. Well, when you gotta go, you gotta go. <laughs> and much like Gennaro, the can can't save her can, as she's grabbed by the ghoulies and flushed onto the Count with an off-screen blood splash. Ooh, someone tell Cousin Eddie the shitter's full. A dock speedboat tries to save itself and make a getaway, but it ends up becoming an obstacle for Finnegan and his ecto goggles. Unfortunately, the goggles do nothing to stop the boats from colliding in a ridiculously large explosion. Why? Why was that boat filled with C4? Anyone. Their ship is now leaking fuel and just all kinds of messed up. But Layla Darling's there to ease their worried minds when she spots the Argo was an Affleck Filmica. Whew. Glad everything worked out for them. We'll take over from here. Well, fuck butts. We've entered mercenary mode, but with no hunk around, Hanover takes Finnegan and Joey with most of his men to investigate the cruise ship, leaving Layla on the boat with Billy. Just Billy. The men make their way to the ballroom and discover it's empty, except for... We got blood here. We got blood here too, mate. But no bodies. So I'll let editor Josh keep sleeping for now. Look at that old cutie. A nearby elevator starts moving, prompting another catchphrase attempt from Finnegan. I got a really bad feeling about this. 
All right, you're not even trying to hide it anymore. Obviously, Finny is a blatant Han Solo type. Their ships are even described the same way. Maybe I can fix this hunk of junk. What a piece of junk. In fact, Harrison Ford was originally cast as Finnegan, with Jim Carrey set to play his non-Wookiee sidekick Joey. But Ford dropped out to do Air Force One instead, robbing us from hearing him yell, Get off my boat! The doors open to reveal nothing. Great. So they might as well just grab what they can before... <laughs> Oh, I love you, Critical Bill. These very not real M1L1 triple pulse assault rifles were built on Calico M955A submachine guns. Their rotating barrels didn't function, but spun when the trigger was pulled, giving the illusion the weapon was firing through them. And somehow my steel trap brain remembers these guns making a cameo in Leslie Nielsen's Wrongfully Accused. Which reminds me, I wonder if I can kill Count Dracula dead and loving it without James finding out. <laughs> no! James knows all. The Merry Mercs continue searching the Ar Ar Argonautica, while Billy, just Billy, mans the torpedoes, and Layla womans the boat hole. Whew, it is tough work, especially when you're interrupted by bloated, naked, Ben Gardner looking corpses. Wait, I'm sorry, did the monster take off this guy's clothes? I mean, the pants I understand, but too much and we're getting into hentai territory. Moving on! Layla gets lost in his total recall eyes before getting yanked out of the boat hole by our unseen monster, thus concluding her career as a tour guide at Oscorp. In the parts shop of the Rumpelstilt Springer, Mamuli gets drooly over some pasted up pastyless porn pics. T-Ray then leaves him and his heart on to investigate a strange sound, which of course results in an off-screen FATALITY! Followed by a friendship when the monster leaves T-Ray's rifle, as well as some Kano bits. Grossy! Okay, now this does not make any sense. How the hell did the creature come into the room, throw down the gun, and then puke without anyone seeing it? Shut up. Okay, but it doesn't. Just shut the fuck up! Okay, God, sorry. I just expected a little more compassion from the leader of the Metkayina clan, but you know, maybe the leader of the Omatakaya clan will be a little nicer. You idiot! Nope. You're all dicks. Trillian escapes and makes her way to the safest place on the boat. The budget expendables then show up to nab her key card and steal some. Money, 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 money. <laughs> Holy fucking head shit! Uh, Vivo fails to live up to his name thanks to a full scream ahead attack from Simon Canton. Damn, I liked him. What a drago. The bloodshed continues when three random passengers are gunned down senselessly. Then Hanover radios back to Mamuli, but the formerly walking dad is now being dragged around by a mini megalodon, slamming into pipes and releasing anime levels of high pressure blood. The Fire Lord Ozai is finally extinguished when the monster pulls him off screen and blows Escobar's blood all over. Joey grabs the generic plot parts needed to fix their boat, and they make their escape with a very thing-like floor displacement. And that makes sense because the second unit director of Deep Rising was Dean freaking Cundy, the cinematographer who shot The Thing as well as Halloween, Jurassic Park, and Back to the Goddamn Future. I'm just going to borrow, not stealing. I'm just gonna borrow that idea. This Chang's market chase was done with a specifically timed hydraulic pump and was scary fun for Kevin J. O'Connor. Every time my gym shoe would have gotten off that one slap, they pressed a button and it would fly up. So it really made you move. Trillian makes it to a non-gremlin infested elevator and tells Joey to shoot. He doesn't listen, nor does the remaining cast. But it's probably because they're all on edge since it's been, you know, 45 minutes and we haven't seen the creature yet. Seriously, can we get a hint of what they are? You, Captain, you got anything? I don't know, how do I know? Never seen anything like it before. Great, well, thanks for nothing, man who once haunted a painting to warn Sam and Dean about a malevolent ghost. The elevator is then attacked before giving us a brief Muzak moment for the trailer. What the hell is that? Girl from Ipanema. And then there was a girl from Ipanema line, which I believe is Treat came up with that. The comedy ends when the teenage Tower of Terror operator does his job and sends them plummeting down. And then some fucking how, no one dies! Even though the force was enough to blow the door off. I, I mean, maybe they all just jumped at the last minute? Huh? That was a jump. They end up in a corridor filled with KY covered bastard skellies. What's the word, boss man? I don't know, I guess there are guts there. I count them, I don't care. I'll add 10 passengers to the count right now, based on the number of skulls I see in all these various shots. Also, I just love how this one is mid-horror crawl. Ooh. 
All this counted carnage also includes a hidden Mickey that special effects makeup artist Stephen Dupuis put in there to entertain the execs at Disney. I'm not quite sure what they thought of it, but I thought it was pretty funny. A Terminator skull crush sets off another unseen creature attack that has it bend the metal walls in a very cool sequence that took 13 days to film. They escape into the accusing kitchen, where Finnegan deduces that Canton is the ship's unseen saboteur. But why would he do this to his own ship? The insurance. That's what the torpedoes are for. Yep, turns out this subpar nautica wasn't exactly a carnival triumph. The cost to operate it was more than they could make back from ticket sales. Ah, that's basically a metaphor for the movie itself. The boys get fighty, these two get flirty, and Joey gets goopy thanks to our big reveal of the CGI tentacle monster. The tentacle creatures were designed by Rob Bottin, the makeup artist famous for The Thing, Robocop, and those literal fucking lizards in fear and loathing that I see all the time in my dreams. I mean nightmares! I don't dream about sex lizards. Visual effects were handled by DreamQuest Images, Blur Studio, and Banned from the Ranch. ILM was brought in later when DreamQuest was having issues. It was kind of a 911 call. All the shots with the creatures were meticulously planned out, sometimes with action figures, sometimes with storyboards, and sometimes with escapees from a Play-Doh fun factory. Our ever would-be hero doesn't give a damn about all their hard work and just shoots it, causing the release of its fresh catch of the day, a still mostly alive Billy Just Billy. Oh, he must have been snagged when looking for Layla earlier on their boat. To achieve this gnarly effect, molds were made of actor Clint Curtis's body, not to be mistaken with Cliff Curtis, the horny mercenary. The molds were filled with gelatin to create these gooey skin applications. Then that was all covered with even more goo. And on the last take, Summer shouted, Pour the whole bucket onto him. Uh, I don't think that's what Rob wanted, but it was too late, we did it, and I think that was the last take. The result is Billy, just Billy's last take, as he collapses and dies from this immaculate digestion. A CGI bloodbath follows with a couple of practical shots thrown in for good measure. In fact, this one here was literally just a corrugated tube dragged across the ceiling. And that tube even returns later as a jump scare. The creature sets its snot sight on Finnegan, finally opening its very Tremors 5 through 7 grabber mouth. Okay, seriously, this thing looks like a predator fucked a face hugger. Which, thanks to the internet, probably exists somewhere online. Please do not send me any of those pictures. I'm sorry, are you flashing my Twitter handle on screen right now? Bree! Stop it! Miss Burke then goes to work, saving Finny from this massive Mesozoan. Finnegan and Trillian run off to find the captain getting yanked through a walkway vagina. They try to help, but it's no use, as the captain goes crunch and is engulfed by the predacle. The captain's death wasn't originally so simple in CGI. Rob Bottin's team built a full-size animatronic puppet of actor Derek O'Connor that could be completely crushed by a practical tentacle. The eyes would bleed, a piece of brain pops out, his ears would bleed, his mouth would bleed. It was, it was a very messy effect. Unfortunately, the effect worked too well for the executives watching the dailies, who said, Yeah, that's really cool. We can, we can never show this. In fact, the studio even tried desperately to edit Deep Rising to a PG-13 rating, but couldn't. The closest they got was a made-for-TV version that's 30 minutes shorter and makes director Steven Summers cry, when instead you should be crying about Van Helsing. No good movie. More shooting begets a theory by Canton, who says these creatures are part of the Atoya family. I think it's pronounced the Anoa'i family. Get out of here with your wrestling jokes I don't understand! And actually, I wasn't familiar with the Atoye family of creatures, but holy shit, these things are freaky. Ugh, oh, looks like a Rick and Morty plumbus. Gross. Canton then reveals that they don't actually eat you. They drink you alive, sucking all the fluids out of a body before excreting the skeletal remains. Fuck. Okay, well, with that disgusting bio lesson complete, they make their way back to Finnegan's boat to repair it with the generic plot parts. Hey, I'm Crazy Benny with Crazy Benny's Discount Plot Parts. Is your movie stuck? Are your characters in need of motivation to go into a dangerous situation that any sane person would avoid? Then I've got your solution. Just have them search for some generic plot parts. I've got gadgets and gizmos aplenty. Who's it's, what's it's, and more. You want thingamabobs? Well, we're, we're out of stock till January. I, I forgot to order more. Come on down to Crazy Benny's Discount Plot Parts today, where our innovations become your character's motivations. Located at the corner of McGuffin and 3rd.
They're stopped by a flooded passageway, so Finnegan and some others scout ahead to see if it's safe. It is. Cool. But that can't be said back on the other side where the tentacruels are on the move. Swim away! Swim away! A very alien resurrection-like underwater chase commences. And when Mason's unable to jar himself free from the creature, he uses his pinky to arm a space grenade, which blows up himself and the creature. Finnegan wants to keep heading to his boat, but Mulligan wants to hole up here. What about you, Hanover? Oh, your hair's on fire. Cool. Well, don't let that distract you from the tentacle that Mulligan refuses to look at. Just turn around, man. He even fires the gun blindly until it retreats. And a nice stove fire keeps it at bay. So what does the eldest son of the Lord of Stormhold do? He fucking turns off the stove, which of course gets him eaten by a tentacle that comes out of nowhere. Sorry, Summers, no taking a mulligan on that death. We get more random hallway walking as the tentacle blocks everyone's path, sending them towards the bow of the ship. Canton takes a little breather and proves to be a little Nick Naughty as he splits off from the group. Hey, dude, why leave? Things can't be that bad at the... The... Oh. My. Con! What the hell is this? This is a job for Editor Josh. Let's do this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Turns out the bow has become the bowels, and for some damned reason, the corpses there are all screaming. But hey, it's just for dramatic effect. These passengers are very, very dead and overacting like hell. Come on, Denise. Now let's see how many bodies Josh was able to count. No! Deep Rising killed Josh! <laughs> okay, well. First off, don't count Josh, but we did see all those passengers earlier, so I guess they should be counted. I don't know, you said something about a definitive number of extras? Yes, there were 450. Okay, all right, use 450 then. Okay, but what about the crew that we saw like earlier? Just use 450. Okay, but then what if we count previous? Just use 450, okay? You heard the man! With 450 extras minus the 16 passengers we already counted, I'm adding 434 passengers, crew, whatever to the count. It's no old parked town, but nothing ever will be. <laughs> the tentacles then prove to be zentacles by washing away all the hard work of the FX department and chasing our survivors back to the endless ship hallways. They catch up with Canton, who weasels away again. <laughs> leaving them high and not so dry. All this water you're seeing meant these sets had to be built in a water tank. The professional LA water tank was going to cost $200,000. So to save money, they built their own in Vancouver. Unfortunately, it ended up rupturing and flooding several blocks, causing over half a million dollars in damages. Oh, sucks to be Summers. Joey and Hanover are chased by some buoys, so Joey grabs a grenade, but forgets to arm it. You idiot! Well, you didn't tell me to do that. And in order to get realistic water effects for the creature during this chase, ILM filmed water elements on a black background. Then CG supervisor Scott Frankel developed a technique for blending the CGI and live action elements in a realistic manner. He called it the Bubble Funk Program. That name also led to some fun conversations around the ILM offices. Anybody that walked into the room that wasn't on the crew would go, what are they talking about? Bubble Funk and the Big Kaboom? What is that? Oh, that's funny. That's what my parents used to say they were doing when, you know, I'd hear weird noises coming from their bedroom. <laughs> oh, my parents fucked. They're able to make one calamari go kablooey, but another isn't far behind. Hanover says the only way to slow them down is to feed them. What are we gonna feed them? Well, I hope they like Italian. But before we can find out, Joey hobbles his way to a dumbwaiter to deliver this meal to another floor. And on that floor, Joey finds a gun, as well as Hanover. Dude, are you okay or are you... Oh, damn! Yeah, they're drinking you alive! Ooh, okay, that looks painful. But uh, not as painful as actually filming this scene. My back had to bend mm, about a, almost a 45 degree angle. Ooh, how do you deal with that for multiple takes? Um, it was just a matter of, um, uh, acting. Acting? Brilliant! Joey doesn't want to see Saget get slurped, so he skedaddles. But not before proving he's the real mercenary, giving Hanover a gun to end his pain, which Hanover makes him immediately regret. 
He tries to turn the gun on himself, but that was the last bullet, meaning Hanover's doomed to a plenty dreadful death as the last of the Mohicans gets eaten. Finnegan and Trillian make it back to their boat, but he lost the generic plot parts along the way. What did, what was the point? What was the point of all this? Now, how are you gonna make it to that island over there on the deep water horizon? I got a plan! Ah, music to a Tremors fan's ears. He sends Trillian off to get one of the cruise ship's jet skis, hilariously called a sea dew But she's stopped by a sea douchebag with a double barrel flare gun. Why is that a thing? I, I guess it's for when your ship is extra sinky? Canton wants the jet ski key, but she needs it to get back to Hemlock Grove. So she takes off with dramatic slow motion flare. Finnegan meets up with Joey on the boat, where they share a moment over the death of his girlfriend Layla. Yeah, that's right, cry it out, O'Connor. She was a cool character, for all of 15 minutes. Finnegan loads up his boat with torpedoes and sets the autopilot to send it straight into the blah blah blahtica. They then see flares, so Finnegan tells Joey to stay with the boat while he finds out where his would-be love interest was taken. He finds Trillian in the ballroom and fires all his bullets at Canton. He misses, allowing Canton to rat scamper away again. <laughs> Before he can leave though, the room begins to shake. Ugh, what now? Uh, now what? Oh right, sorry. The budget erupts once again with explosions galore, giving way to our final boss encounter. Meet the Octolus. Much like a graboid, the tentacles we've seen were just part of a larger creature. It's been living in the bow and sending its little mouths all over the ship looking for food, combining delivery and takeout in one. The Octolus grabs the substitute substitute, but doesn't kill him for some reason. Instead, it just punches him, then brings him in closer, revealing its albino seal looking face. I, I guess it somehow learned to respect T-Bill, unlike the rest of Hollywood, but unfortunately the feeling isn't mutual. What are you looking at? Tree Williams. Any relation to Ashley J? Finnegan and Trillian escape the tentacle lovin' and back on the boat, a broken window and a gooey beret lead Finnegan to believe Joey is dead. Oh man, guess you'll have to see him for boat drinks in heaven. He then finds Trillian and they hop on a sea dooby dooby doo in order to blow this pop stand. But after they build up some speed, they find their exit cocktopus blocked. They can't even stop it with a road handy. Cock it! So they find an alternate route in a chase sequence that took some inventive techniques to actually film. Originally, Summers wanted to use Steadicams to follow the actors through the water, but cinematographer Howard Atherton said there was no way that was gonna work. The whole thing's top heavy. You got all the weight up top. Your feet are being dragged back all the time by the force of the water. No way you can do it. His solution was to install a dolly track along the piping in the ceiling and then hang the camera upside down to follow the actors. When it came down to getting the water displacement for the CGI tentacles, they dragged a metal plate behind the sea dew which itself was being dragged by a computerized pulley system. While they're busy chasing on the Argonautica, oh, I said it right! Canton does a Tanya McQuad impression onto Finney's boat. He breaks his leg in the process, ha ha ha, and the Boston public vice principal finds that none of the controls work, so all he can do is squirm and squeal, Bleh. as the boat collides with the pirate noise erotica. Damn it. Thought I had it. The resulting explosion finally puts a cork in this master of deceit. And oh boy, what an explosion it is. Again, what were these boats filled with? Fucking napalm? Whatever, it's still a thrilling escape and a perfect shot for the movie's poster. This epic explosion was actually done with a miniature ship that blowed up real good. Finnegan and Trillian stutter away towards the island, and once there, all seems well on Finnegan's Isle. That is, until Trillian sees something in the water. It's Joey! He's not dead after all. Now, he did die in the original cut of the movie, but test audiences loved his character so much they reshot the ending. In fact, FX House banned from the ranch even digitally added a surfboard to the explosion to explain how he got his bodacious mode of transport. You'd think it's a minor thing, but it's really important to help tell the story. Our triangle of survivors don't give in to their sadness when it comes to their new accommodations. This looks like a nice enough place. And they quickly learn there'd be monsters on this island, and not the smoke kind. This epic cliffhanger was shot on the cliffs of Malibu with enhancement by ILM, who used a matte painting, and for the first time ever, computer-assisted motion tracking. Now, a common assumption is that this is Skull Island, and that Summers was developing a reboot of King Kong as his next film. But an interview with cinematographer Howard Atherton cited a different film. Because Stephen always spoke about his next film, Journey to the Center of the Earth. That movie never materialized, at least not with Summers' attack. 
attached. Though there is one with his pal, Brendan Fraser. Did our short-term investment in T-Bill net us a ton of interesting kills? Let's find out and get to the... Now what? Oh, oh it's got me! Oh God, it's got me! It's so horrifying! It looks so good! <laughs> James, we're gonna get to ILM to fix this in post, right? No, man, we spent all of our money on the award show. Damn it! Well, 460 people died in Deep Rising. 13 men, three women, and 444 unknown, giving us a chart as gray as the gene in this movie. And that makes this the second highest kill count of all time, just behind Dude Bro Party Massacre 3. Now with a runtime of 106 minutes, that gave us a kill on average every 13.8 seconds. But still, it will never beat Dude Bro. <laughs> Oh, tentacle! I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Billy. Just Billy. His partially digested body is fully horrifying, with a perfect blend of digital and practical effects that have aged well even by today's standards. Dull machete for lamest kill goes to Layla. Honestly, I really liked her character, and she deserved better than an off-screen end that made this movie even more of a sausage fest, which is saying something about a movie filled with dick tentacles. And that's it. Deep Rising was released in 1998 and failed to rise to the challenge of that other big boat movie. Next week, I'm going to be covering the Collector franchise, which is two movies, so kind of a franchise. But until then, I'm a man who once ate a wasabi duck on a dare, and this has been The Kill Count. Hey everybody, thanks for watching Zorin's episode on Deep Rising. Yeah, Deep Rising, T-Bill, T-Bill, T-Bill. Zorin's gonna be doing some episodes uh, for the next few weeks. I did Frogs just cause that episode was already pretty much done, but now I'm uh, gonna be taking a little break and going on a honeymoon. So be nice to him while I'm gone, all right? Oh, thanks James, I really appreciate it, buddy. Be yeah. nicer than my character is to him. Yes. <laughs> it's a character, we're good friends. He it's, says that. It, we're, it's a character, Zoran. It's a character, and yeah, we love each it's other. It's a character. We love each other, we and do. I'm very nice to Zoran. Very Zorin. much so. Go on your honeymoon. Go I on will. your honeymoon. Be good people. <laughs>